Hi, good morning. This is Kathy Brandon with www.kathybrandonspeaks.com. And this is our third part of our six part series with Dr. Michael Harris. Welcome, Michael. Good morning. Good morning. We are videoing a little bit earlier than we're used to this morning, so if we look a little sleepy, we're both kind of chugging our coffee, trying to wake up a little bit. But what we're going to have today is we're going to just have a conversation with Michael. I wanted you guys to have a chance to get to know who Michael is as a person so that you can understand his commitment to life altering transformation and I don't mean that in like a self-development woo-woo way I mean that in a very tangible um, a very tangible way uh, Michael tell us a little bit about you um, tell us kind of the normal stuff where are you from do you have sisters and brothers you know have you been in Texas your whole life or when did you get here and do you like it here okay um, I was actually born in Alamogordo, New Mexico, and I went to grade school in New Mexico and California, and then I, uh, when I went to high school, I, I, my parents moved to San Antonio, so I went to high school in San Antonio, and I went to, I did my undergrad in, in West Texas at a, at a college called Sol Ross, and, you know, just just the norm, just the normal stuff, you know. Uh, just went to school, played football. I was president of my rodeo club, you know. Just <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so coming back to that. <laughs> so I, I got I got a scary picture I can show you next time you come to the office. Um, but you know, just just a, a normal life. I mean, I, I, when when I was a kid, um, I just absolutely knew that I wanted to be a veterinarian. And uh, I just absolutely, that was all I ever thought about. And then I went to college. And after, uh, you know, two and, a half, two and a half semesters of college, I knew something else absolutely that I absolutely positively did not want to be a veterinarian. <laughs> now, okay, so, so what made that change for you? Um... You know, I don't really have a clue. It just, um, it, it just, I, I, I took a look at, at, at what my options were. Um, I, I really wanted to, I really wanted to be in large animal research. I, had, you know, as a pre-vet major, I had a double major in chemistry. I had a minor in math, and I pretty much wanted to spend my, my life in a, in a lab coat doing, uh, doing research. And, and at that particular time during that uh, political environment, they had cut all the research pro programs and stuff. So my options were um, I could take care of, uh, of Miss Becky's uh, poodle, you know, at a standard veterinary clinic, or I could be a uh, USDA inspector, which would have meant that I'd spent my entire life in, in, in a uh, in, uh, yeah, you know, in a meat processing plant in a refrigerator, and and that just didn't sound like fun to me. <laughs> right. So I I I, I uh, just decided to do something else, and, and um, I I finished I finished what I needed to do in college, and I got out, and um, I just like I, I worked in, in different jobs. I worked for I worked for a marble company. And I traveled all over the U.S. and, and lived on the East Coast for almost ten years, and it, it, it you know it wasn't horrible, except that it wasn't particularly satisfying. Um, I, I, what I was doing was pretty much what everybody else was doing, which was I was going to work and I was coming home, and uh, all of my focus was away from work and what I was doing on the weekends, and. You know, you figure you spend at least 40 hours, if not 50 hours a week doing what you do for a living. It just makes sense to me that you really ought to love it. Right. So I started. Uh, so I started looking for something that I that I would actually enjoy, and I um, and I think I mentioned this before, just out of sheer, you know, coincidence in quotations because I don't believe in coincidence. 
uh, I saw a advertisement for a communication class um, and I just picked up the phone and called them and they had a spot open in the seminar and that was my and that was my first introduction to NLP and um, it was after I completed that I, I had pretty much knew for a fact that that was what I wanted to do is I wanted to work with people I wanted to help people um, grow and help them be the best you know be the best as you can be if, you know it doesn't matter to me if you sweep floors for a living as long as you're passionate about sweeping floors and, or if you're you know it, it just doesn't matter I, I just think that people should be passionate about what they do and, and you know maybe I, maybe I'm incredibly brave doubt it uh, if, if I had had any clue about how uh, interesting my path would be I, I don't I don't really know that I would have hurled myself at, you know over the cliff into into what I'm doing but I'm certainly glad I did um, but it just it just astounded everyone around me my friends my family and stuff they couldn't imagine why on earth that I would quit a, a really good job um, in order to do something, you know, silly like liking what I do for a living, and we did, I, and I just can't imagine doing it any other way. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, now talk to us about you've had multiple businesses. I like to call people like you a a a, a serial entrepreneur of sorts because. You know, Michael, everything you touch just is successful, and I really think that has something to do with the fact that you don't settle for things that are mediocre, right? What I see about you, what I admire about you in, in, in your craft, um, but also you as an individual, the more I get to know you as a person, mm -hmm. what I see is you have this almost cons obsessive passion for excellence and it's not obsessive in in a in an unhealthy way it's an obsession for you and those around you to have the 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 self-worth and the self-esteem and the confidence and the communication tools right to excel mm -hmm. in what we want to do right like I had the choice in my mm -hmm. life to follow multiple paths um, I made the same choice you did because I want people to have the opportunity to really pursue their dreams and, and understand that it's not that hard, it's not any harder to pursue your dreams as it is to pursue some other job that everybody thinks is just normal. Um, or somebody else's dream. Yeah, right? So talk mm -hmm. to me about that because what I'm hearing, and tell me if I'm just hearing things, but there was a moment in your life and I'm not saying it was a childhood experience. I'm not saying that it's a mis mistake you made in your life. But there was a time in your life where, you know, you came to a crossroads. And I think you started talking a little bit about it. I want to dig into that because I think there are a lot of people that are at that crossroad right now in their life. Mm -hmm. And they need to understand, you know, the hell you're going through when you're at that crossroads in your life. And you also need to know that you're not alone. People have been there. They've made that choice. They're on the other side of it. So two things in all of that that I want you to talk about. One, I want you to talk about your quest for excellence within yourself. And then okay. your mission to other people operating at their unique excellence and I say that okay. deliberate because there's a unique excellence for everybody and you tap into that so talk about that first and then I'll talk about something else in a minute okay well I, and I hope my answer doesn't disappoint you because uh, my model of the world is so vastly different than what you're describing um, if you want to talk about a like a defining moment yes one of the one of the defining moments that I had in my lifetime, I can remember it just like it was two minutes ago, when I was about 16 years old, and I was laying on the couch as 16 year olds are apt to do, you know, doing this, 
<laughs> and I was watching TV. Okay, and I, I don't know where my parents were. They were off doing something. And I was watching, do you remember the show? It was called Wide World of Sports. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Or, mm -hmm. or, or, or are you too young for that? Okay. No. And they used to have these. They used to have these all these incredible competitions, yes. and it was it was way before pay per view and cable TV and all that. Stuff. You know, we had three TV channels. Right. Anyway, I'm watching Wide World of Sports, and I'm watching uh, they're flipping back and forth between somebody who's hang gliding and Joe Bob over here who is doing some type of competitive kayaking and he's going through you know all these twists and turns and I'm laying there and I'm watching this and, and I have this thought and that thought was instead of watching these people do that I could be doing that and I got up and I shut the TV off and I think that the next time that I actively turned a television on was probably 10 years later I started doing stuff mm -hmm. and I, 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 when I first got, got involved in fitness I, and it used to be my old joke I used to tell people I've been in fitness for so long that when I used to go jogging because they didn't call it running back then it was called jogging you know and I'd be running down the road and somebody in a car would pull up and, and ask me if I needed a ride <laughs> okay I've been stopped by I've been stopped by the police you know I'm running down the road I've got my little workout suit on and a cop pull over and goes why are you running boy it's like <laughs> it's just, anyway but that's kind of how if I had to pick the that was the beginning okay mm -hmm. and then uh, you mentioned that I've had several jobs uh, you probably don't know this but I uh, used to own a horseshoeing business it's how I supported myself in college I used to shoe horses and and, and I worked on and I worked on ranch you know my parents didn't have a whole lot of money so I on weekends I would work on ranches and it was it was really a great deal because it was it was fifteen dollars a day and they would feed you twice and I was a starving student so like fifteen dollars I lived in a little bitty town where I was going to college there wasn't anywhere to spend money uh, so fifteen bucks made, made a huge difference and they fed me twice which was good because the um, the college cafeteria was uh, only open six and a half days a week they'd feed you breakfast and lunch and you were on your own for dinner so it's like it, it, it just it, it it may not make sense to anybody but I didn't know any different I didn't, you know we didn't have a whole lot of money but everybody I knew was like that so I never knew of never I never thought we were poor okay I just yeah. thought that if we needed money then I needed to go I needed to go make it um, the other defining uh, the, we talked about this briefly one of the defining moments is I had a really really good job working for a marble company. I was the youngest uh, foreman that they ever had. I was the youngest superintendent they ever had. Um, and, and back in the, in the late, uh, late 70s, or it would be early 80s, you know, making 48000 a year and having your own company truck and a credit card is considered success. Right. But what was interesting was is that I hated it. I absolutely hated it because I had to work around I had to work around people who were just uninspired they were they 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 were walking around in a coma and and a lot of them uh, I don't know if you know this but construction work is really good work right and uh, particularly if you don't have an education or let's say something interesting like you're an ex felon Right. Okay, so you can make good money, but I, I mean, working around it was a it was a rough business. It wasn't fun, and it was hot in the summer. It's cold in the winter. You don't work. You don't work when it's raining or snowing. You know, so it wasn't really it wasn't really a consistent level of income. You have to travel to, particularly in the marble business, you have to travel to follow the work. So I wanted something 
that was stable for me and my kids and something that I was going to do. And if I was going to do it for the next, you know, 27 or 30 years, it might as well be something that you enjoy. Yes. Okay. So that's how I started doing the, uh, the uh, NLP training and stuff. And my original concept of NLP is I never really wanted to do any change work with other people. I wanted to use the NLP to help people set their own goals and to do all of that stuff. And during this whole time period that I'm talking about when I was going to college and I was working here and I was working there and doing that, I was doing martial arts. So I originally moved from Florida, when I, I was in Florida and I got my black belt, when I came to Texas, I actually came to Texas uh, to open up a martial arts studio. And you probably didn't know that either. Okay, and at that particular time, um, martial arts was ebbing mm -hmm. and fitness was beginning to go like this. And it was really kind of an interesting um, kind of an interesting chain of events that I always I always knew that weight training in conjunction with any sport was good and the mindset back then was that if if you did a sport you did a sport you did not lift weights 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 made you slow or ma weights made you stiff or clumsy and right. and you know that's not what people think anymore right so I actually had a kid, and he was a, he was a, he was one of my students, and I started weight training him, and he lost a whole bunch of weight, and he and it was it was just remarkable how quickly that he lost weight and got fit, and just out of curiosity, you know, and this is even this is before I ever knew about anything called personal training. His mom said, "It's just amazing what has happened to my son. Do you think that that would work for me?" And I'm like, sure, why not? Right. So I started weight training. Something's going on with your camera, by the way. No, I'm looking at that. Yeah. Um, Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, anyway, I started weight training this lady, and, and guess what? She lost weight. And then she told somebody and told somebody. And the, and the next thing I know, I'm in this brand new industry uh, called personal training that nobody's ever heard of. And my, my 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 gym was doing so my, my my martial arts studio was doing so poorly and I was doing so well with personal training I just went shift and and that's one of the things that you're going to discover about my overall presiding philosophy is I don't think that people just because you do what you're doing right now Mm -hmm. Does it mean that it won't turn into something different or better in five years? Right. Does that make any sense? Yes. Okay. Because yes. nobody, nobody on earth could have told me that that you know when I uh, that when I was in my fifties that I would be a a uh, professional hypnotist and I would have clients all over the world. Yeah, I never could have imagined that. Right. But I think that, that part of it has to do is that, uh, that I am so open and so flexible that mm -hmm. to me that there, there's, no, there's no disconnect between, okay, I'm, do, I'm shoeing horses, I'm working construction, I open up a martial arts studio, I'm a personal trainer, you know, and now I'm, up, now I'm doing this. And now I'm, doing this. I, I'm just curious about what I'm going to be doing five years from now. Right. <laughs> okay. It's all the same thing, you know. It's just it's it's life. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so there's been there's been lots of overlaps. I, I I'm not somebody who's going to quit doing one thing, and you know then there's this period where I'm unemployed and I don't have you know anything. Uh, I I do things like this, you know. I, I start I start projects, right, and. Right. Uh, you know that I, you know that I have a blog talk radio show. Yes, yes. Okay, and, and you and I have actually talked about it. And I said this is like big fun, and I have no clue whatsoever if I'm ever going to make any money out of it or okay. or whatever. But it's just a great way to market. Well, guess what? I now have two na two national PTSD online 
groups that are that are a result of this radio show. It was it's the, uh, the, uh, an income an income stream has been created right. that I never never could imagine. So I think that if you wanted to talk about overall philosophy, yeah, my the best recommendation that I could give somebody is be open to whatever the universe is presenting to you. Take a look at it. And I get lots and lots of opportunities. And, and just because you have a good a good opportunity and it you know it looks good, it could probably work, yet you have to evaluate, is that what you really want to do? Right. Because you're you're kind of in the same business that I am. You help people. How many times has somebody come through your door or sent you an email or given you a phone call and said, I have this great business and I would love for you to come work for me. Right. <laughs> right? Okay. Which is, you know, it's very flattering and, and it's wonderful and, 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 and all that good stuff. But are you, if by working for that person, are you funding your dream or are you funding someone else's dream? Yes. Okay. And I have a tendency to uh, to think that my my dream is just as important as anybody else's. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So, but I, I mean, there are, there are lots and lots and lots of sales organizations and stuff, and and even uh, you've read the book uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki. Yes. Okay. And I happen to agree with Robert that. If you have a stable job and you've got a mortgage and three kids and they're going to go to college and all this other stuff and you want to get out of the rat race, one of the easiest ways to do that, in my opinion, would be network marketing. Okay? It, it's a great way to make money. It's relatively simple. Anybody can do it. And it's, a, it's an interesting way to actually increase your income to the point where you can have the flexibility to change jobs. Right. Okay. Right. But I get far I, I get far more satisfaction out of helping people make you know, make their lives work and stuff like that. And yeah, I could probably go work for just about any sales organization and I could do stellar. Okay. Right. Right. But why but for me this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay. And, and does that make sense? Yeah. It makes and, and, sense. Now, yeah. one of the questions that I want to ask you is, you know, let's let's you know, let's give a couple of things to take away for, you know, the people who are in that corporate job, the people who are just starting out on their in their business, the people who have been in business a while and they have to reinvent themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And so let's give them like what are two really hard earned pieces of wisdom that you can give them before we kind of close this recording. Um, well, you know, and you also know that I do business and personal coaching. So yeah. I'll just, I'll just give you a, here, here's your, here's your, uh, here's your nickels worth. Okay. Yeah. When it comes to uh, talking to somebody who is, uh, their, their industry is being replaced by, outsourcing or robotics or whatever it is or they're just you know they've been doing what they're doing for 25 years and they're just ready for a change yeah okay or they've gotten divorced or they're bored or whatever it is the very first thing that I ask them is what do you like and what what do you do well okay and if you can if you can get the person to think about what they really like Okay, and what they really do well, and put those things two together. Now you have the perfect combination for a for a career or a job, you know, some type of a of a job that they will really really like. Okay, and what I'm what I'm looking for from that that look in their face or that or that or that congruent look in their face or uh, that tells me 
that what they're talking about. Um, like for example, I know, and I keep going back to your frisbee golf. So yeah. when you yeah. when you get tired of me picking on your frisbee golf, let me know. Okay. Not never, uh, never. The more awareness, the more people know about frisbee golf, the better. So keep talking okay. about it. Okay, my ca my camera's doing something weird, but I'm gonna keep on talking. Um, you probably don't know this, but you could probably you like frisbee golf so well that you do it for free, right? Oh, without a doubt, yes. Absolutely. Okay, so what? Money, what, what, what I, I will spend money to play disc golf. Like I won't just do it for free. Right. I love it so I will spend money on the sport. Yes. Okay, so what, where I'm going with this is, you know, what is it that you like so much that you would let people pay you to do it? You know, you know what I really like about it is I like the community, and I like the fact mm -hmm. that it is a sport. It's a real relaxed sport, and so mm -hmm. in order to do really well at disc golf, you have to relax. You have to not think too hard. Mm -hmm. um, you can't overthink golf or else you play really bad. <laughs> yeah. I really like the training of that. I'm an analyzer by nature and so for me to embrace something so passionately that forces me out of that thinking space into just the feeling of my mm -hmm. body and the movement and mm -hmm. the line and the wind and the nature. You know, I really love that. I love, I love the duality of it. Right? You have to think about your shot. You have to look at the geometry of it, and then you have to get out of your own way and fling the dog on disc. And so it really, exactly. it, yeah. And I'm over forty, and so in order for me to stay in shape without spending all my time with personal trainers and all my time with all this stuff, I had to find something that I could add to my life that fits. And okay. disc golf was you, that. Yeah. Okay. Time out. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. You, no, it's okay. When you review this video, yeah. Okay. And you look and you see that passion in your face, and you were just, you were completely gone. Right. Okay. Right. Talking about golf. Okay. That's how, pe in my opinion, that's how the people should feel about their life's work. Yes. Yes. Okay. So that's what I'm when I when I am coaching someone or I'm counseling someone. That's what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because when you talk about that level of commitment, that level of passion, that's when money gets irrelevant. Yes. Yes. Okay. And yeah, there are there are there are specific realities. You know, we have. We have we have that whole food shelter clothing thing, okay? Right. right. But but like let, let's think about this. How much money do you really really need? Okay. And I'm not talking about you know living you know living like a monk and, and then you have to go to the YMCA and take a shower or stuff like that. <laughs> like because that's totally not me. Okay. Because right. just so you know, I know I'm wearing a T-shirt, but I'm the Prada shoe guy. Okay, right. so so that's absolutely. <laughs> and but we have we have become a culture uh, of almost wretched excess. You know, do you really need five TVs? Right. Right. Okay. Right. Do you really need you know and you know, uh, I recently uh, made a vanity purchase. You know, uh, a friend of mine had a uh, has a uh, 1993 uh, Mercedes uh, 450 SLC. You know, the uh, the one with the interchangeable hardtop and and convertible. Okay, yeah. and it was like a stupidly low price, so I bought it. Okay, okay. but I'm going to keep it. Forever. <laughs> so, so my my suggestion is that you, you think about, and I think I think that what we're talking about it, it is, in, and you hear me use this word a lot, is ecology. Okay. 
So if I had to, if if we had to sum up this one takeaway thing, is I don't add things in answer to how do I do what I do. I don't add things into my life that are not ecological for the entire system. Okay, so you know that I do yoga. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody that talks to me for five minutes knows that I do yoga. Right. And I do that and I do that five days a week. But I don't do it on weekends because I want to spend time with my family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? So if somebody was going to ask me to add one more physical activity thing into my week, I would have to very carefully to see how that would fit in the eight different sections of my life. And probably the the thing that you would have to be the easiest to get out of me would be a commitment to try it for a hundred days, and I would add this one thing into my into my world for a hundred days, mm -hmm. and I would see how it ecologically affects the rest of the system. Does it affect my uh, friend? Does it affect my friends and family? Does it affect my health? Does it affect my personal spiritual growth? Is it in, you know? It does it enhance or does it affect my fun and recreation? How much money, you know? Everything costs money. Okay, so how much money is the amount of fun that I receive from this worth the amount of lost income? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I look at these things ecologically, and that's kind of where where I come from, and. You know, I, and I really appreciate that you say that I've, that I that I've been that I've been successful, um, and I can tell you that I've made a bunch of money. Right, and when I say success, yeah, but I can also but I can also tell you that when that was when that was my only goal of making money, what I found was was that I'd start something, it would build up, and then I'd get bored with it, and then I'd start something else. And now, and my perception now is completely different. And you know, I have every intention of the very last day that I'm alive on this earth. I will probably work a couple hours that day. You know, so when you're thinking about when you're thinking about career, you're thinking about lifestyle and stuff like that. What is it that you're going to be able to do for the next, you know, hundred years? You know, middle age is one twenty. So I figure, you know, we're going to live past that. So what is it that you're going to want to do day after day for the next hundred years? And, and you know, it better be fun. <laughs> you know what? I think that's a good place for us to um, stop for this okay. video. Um, I want to recap some of the gems that Michael has left us with. You know, the first gem is, you know, we really need to look at what we like. Because, you know, according to Michael, and he's lived his life based on this principle, and so, you know, it's very important for us to look at what we really like, and we can craft a career around what we like. The second is, you know, let's look at what we like to do with our time. You know, we want to build something that is so exciting and so fun and so natural. Like, I like the fact that you call life an ecosystem. I think that's that's a very good term for each one of us to adopt because as we find things that we're passionate about, as we find things we like, as we find things that you know may not fit us anymore, we have to look at the ecosystem of our life and see what's going to fit and what's not. And so it took me a long time to even make the decision to have a physical activity, right? But I had to pick one that wasn't going to take me out of my family, take me out of my life. And I think that's a very important perspective that Michael has shared with us today is, you know, if you are looking at building a business, if you're looking at your career, if you're looking at your life and you're trying to define, you know, where you're at, what you need to be doing, you know, Michael, tell people how to get in touch with you and how we can connect with you. How can we access your knowledge? Okay. Well, um, you can you can go to my you can go to my regular website, which is drmichaelharris.com. Uh, you can send me an email to drm at 
drmichaelharris.com. You can call. I didn't. You know, I didn't post my phone number on the on the thing. My 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 direct telephone number is two one four seven eight nine seven four nine zero. I'm like probably the easiest guy to get a hold of. If you talk it, type in. Michael Harris PhD on Google and you can't find me it's because you're not looking and okay. because every oh. single so, every single social media that I have is Dr. Michael Harris I, I you can find me I mean I'm easy to find <laughs> okay good okay. what I want to do at this point is I'm going to go ahead and close this workshop I do want to invite everyone to this is our third of six so we still have um, three more that we're going to do we're going to, in the next three um, video webinars, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk a little bit more about weight loss and the hypnoband. I want to cover some additional questions. I've been doing a little research, Michael, so I have some questions for you. Um, you know, after that, we're going to talk about okay. our golf game. Um, I want to really spend some time talking about how hypnotherapy helped your golf game. My golf game has improved significantly from, it took me about six to eight strokes um, to just do just, you know, maybe 300 feet, right, or 300 yards um, from the tee box to the basket. Now, with, with very little extra practice, it's more of a mindset, and I really want us to go into that. My golf game, I'm, I'm popping pars, I'm popping fours. Um, yesterday I just went out and played some golf and I fored a hole that I don't even know who I was yesterday playing golf. I've never done that and only like the big boys of golf play like that. So, And I was by myself, of course, nobody there to see my brilliance. But, you know, it, it, I really do, right? I really do attribute it to a lot of the work I'm doing with you, Michael. So I want to take some time. I know a lot of people who are really into golf, they want to get better. They may be frustrated with where their game is. And so I just want to take Are we going to hawk my are, Yeah. Are we going to hawk my book? Oh, of course we're going to hawk your book. That's exactly what I'm talking about. I want people to know that you have this formula in this work to improve the golf game, whether it's ball golf, whether it's um, disc golf, whether it's ultimate frisbee. Um, and these tools that Michael teaches you can be used for any sport. And so I don't want to spend too much time. We've already gone over our time. Um, please reach out to Michael. You can reach out to him through drmichaelharris.com. You can certainly go to my Facebook page. Um, I am Happiness Chick on Facebook, all one word. And Michael's one of my friends. I post about him all the time. So just troll my profile and you'll find Michael. And then we will post this video probably within the next hour or two hours. And so thank you so much, Michael, for just revealing yourself to us, letting us know who you are. Um, you know, I love the work you do, but I also love the man you are. And so I think you're like this double bonus in my life and I'm just thrilled that you're giving me the chance to to introduce you like this to other people thank you so much Michael well thank you and, and thank you for not making me raise my skirt up too high it was it was actually you know it wasn't too terrible <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of you know I kind of like like the analogy of the frog in the pot right each time we do a video series we dig a little bit deeper into who you are with all the other stuff we talk about. So I'm hoping at the end of uh oh. Yes. Okay, great. Hi, Carol. Hi. Hi, I have to go now. Okay. Bye, Michael. See you next time. Bye. Bye.